So in the second talk, Daniel Zhu from Meta is going to tell us about improving the reliability of BPF trays. So let's welcome him. Excellent. Hi, so uh, I'm Daniel. I've been working on BPF Trace for a few years now, and this is a talk on improving reliability in BPF Trace. Let's see if this. Okay, it's not working. All right, it looks like it got reworked. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Okay, so the agenda, we're going to kind of approach this top down. So we're going to kind of start at the high level, like, what do I think reliability is and why do we care? And then we're going to move down towards techniques and we'll end with some of my current focus. So, what is reliability? Uh, I think reliability is a pretty nebulous and abstract concept. And so, to spare us the philosophical debate, um, perhaps consider this scenario instead. Let's say you have a problem, and then you decide to use BPF trace to solve it, bug it or troubleshoot it. What you really don't want is a second problem, right? You, have to, you want to focus on your first thing. So that's kind of how I'm going to frame this entire discussion about reliability. So what does no second problems mean, right? Uh, so I have some specific examples here. Obviously, it's not comprehensive. It's just some examples. First one is a clear error if something's not possible. So in the BPF world and the kernel space, there's a lot of things you just can't do. And that's OK. But we should be really clear about what we can and cannot do. So if, for example, try to do something the verifier is going to reject, have a good error message and point to where in the source that you're doing something. What you don't want is the user to get a verifier error and then try to map back bytecode to where in the script they're trying to do something. That would be a second problem. Uh, the second example shouldn't be too surprising, <laughs> ironically. Uh, principle of least surprise, we shouldn't try to surprise the user. So one example where we've historically been kind of bad at this is maps, so printing from a map. So for example, let's say you have map A equals 4, uh, print map A, map A equals 10. Uh, almost always you're going to get map A equals 10, and that's because print is asynchronous due to kernel limitation just in the past. Uh, you can't actually grab all the values out of a map and uh, serialize it and send to user space. What you have to do is you have to send a notification to user space saying, hey, print map A. Uh, in newer kernels, you're actually able to serialize all the values. And so we could actually fix this, and we're looking at fixing it. But going forward, this is uh, an example of something that we should try not to do anymore because it is quite surprising behavior. Uh, the final example I have on here is misleading data. I personally th think this is the worst possible outcome because uh, if it gives you a wrong value, that's hugely problematic because now you're on this wild goose chase and you're kind of doubting reality. Uh, we should really prefer to just say something isn't possible if it's not possible. But obviously, this is easier said than done because it's quite a complex space we're in and we might not. Uh, so we'll try to fix it over time. So what's getting in the way of reliability? Well, uh, so let me first say this is not like a complaint slide. This is more of a, think of it as constraints. These are all the constraints we're solving for. Uh, we're sitting on top, so BPF, and by extension BPF trace, kind of sits on top of an intersection of notably complex domains. And so every one of these domains has made their own trade-offs. And so sitting on top of that, we kind of have to assemble all of these things and make something useful out of it. One example uh, I'm going to give here is LLVM. And so we use LLVM to turn, uh, well, to, to emit a BPF bytecode. And LLVM, the way it's developed, the way it's packaged, the way it's distributed, it's all pretty challenging. We've, for example, we've dedicated a lot of time into just building and running tests against all the different versions of LLVM out there, because there's, you know, they release quite frequently. Uh, more specifically than that, uh, static linking. Static linking is super useful. Our users love uh, having a statically linked BPF trace binary. But Getting LLVM to statically link is quite challenging, and I've spent at least 100 or so hours of my time over a few years uh, really making this work. And it's just, it's not simple. That's all I have to say. Uh, on top of that, every LLVM release has, you know, they change their APIs, stuff starts to break, you have to figure out what broke, and then see how you can map it back and add a bunch of if defs and whatnot. 
Uh, although I will say LLVM 19 is the first release in BPFJ's history where we didn't get any API breakages. So that's really awesome, and I hope, I hope that continues. Uh, I have more examples here. LLVM IR is tricky. Uh, get element pointer, GEP instruction, that one's really tricky to wrap your mind around. I always joke about having to, or wanting to tattoo, like, the docs on my thigh so I can just look down. But uh, anyways, that's, ju that's just one example. Uh, there's a bunch of other things. Uh, the other point I have here is that language design is hard. Uh, I feel like that doesn't need to, doesn't need too much explanation. We all realize it's a pretty hard problem. Uh, BPF script, that's what we call the BPF trace language. Uh, it's not perfect, no language is perfect, but we do try to make it uh, more useful over time and try to improve it and fix things that we can fix without causing too much breakage. Uh, the kernel is a pretty tricky place as well. In order to develop BPF trace effectively, you have to know a lot about kernel internals. You have to keep up with developments. Um, I mentioned previously that newer kernels are able to iterate over all the entries in a map, and then that way you can serialize things. So you have to keep on top of these developments and know when to leverage them, right? Uh, we kind of have a soft policy of supporting the oldest LTS kernel still uh, available. So we have to know when we can use a new feature and when we cannot. For core features, we try to use the lowest common denominator. Uh, for fancier and newer features that can be put behind a feature flag, well then that can probably be possible. We also hit some issues like ABBA deadlocks that we have to work around with some custom recursion prevention. Uh, it's a tricky space, that's all I want to say. And then the final big bullet point here is uh, open source environment. I mean, this is sort of an open source conference. It, it probably comes at no surprise to a lot of people, but sometimes you don't have a lot of resources. You just got to make do with what you got. You don't have much, so you know, you just make do. And I think BPF Trace does a pretty good job of making do. So this is a sample of recent reliability issues that we've addressed. Uh, even when I zoom out and look at more issues than this, it's not clear to me that there's a common pattern, meaning there isn't one component that we could focus a lot on and have some kind of outsized results and impact from. And so to me, that's kind of a good thing and a bad thing. A good thing is we didn't mess up any one particular thing, but the bad thing is there's, it's, a, it's a little harder to address reliability uh, in the abstract. So my answer to this is a holistic approach. And so more specifically what I mean by that is to not focus on only the code, but uh, you know, I want to focus on the entire development process, like how we design things, how we develop features, how we learn from our mistakes, and how we prevent the same mistakes from reoccurring. Uh, mapping that into the real world, I think that, for, to me, this means CI. I think CI is the most practical way to put this philosophy in the process, into practice. Um, so now this is the techniques section of the talk. So CI obviously has clear procedural benefits. It automates feedback, it accelerates velocity, uh, exercises different configurations, blah, 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 that's all the obvious stuff. And these are great because they help mitigate the effects of known unknowns and known knowns. So an example of a known known is that with each LLVM release, the bytecode changes, right? The bytecode admits changes because they're opt constantly optimizing things. And so we know how to deal with that. Example of a known unknown, would be uh, LVM APIs changing. Like we know they're gonna change, but we don't know which one is going to change, so we have to run this full matrix every single time and just figure out what broke. But what I find most compelling about a properly done CI is that it addresses unknown unknowns as well. So in, the, uh, in an abstract way, I kind of see it as a place where you can encode and store domain knowledge over time. Um, that can be kind of indefinitely remembered. Because uh, I'm a pretty forgetful person, but the machine can uh, effectively remember forever if you teach it how to. But there's a lot of challenges with CI. CI is not free. Uh, I'm sure everyone's interacted with an unhelpful or bad CI before. And I'm not saying BPF to chase the CI is really good. I've definitely seen better. But I do think it's pretty good for the investment and the scope of the project. So in the next few slides, I'm going to kind of share some techniques that we developed and we've had experience running and using. And I think they're pretty good. Uh, and kind of where they're at and what we want to invest more in in the future. So the core of our CI is Nix. I think Nix is a, uh, well, so Nix is a lot of things, right? It's a language, it's an operating system, it's a package manager, but for this talk, let's just call it a package manager. Our entire CI config is done in a single file. It's uh, in the flake.nix, we're using the flake stuff. Uh, and from there, we do absolutely everything. And the really cool thing is this basically works on any Linux system, and you can do it like bit for bit reproducible. At least in theory, we've had bugs, but we fixed them. 
another nice property is that the entire dependency tree is in your is in total control, right? So you can apply dot patch basically anywhere in your dependencies. So let's say you want to apply a patch to libelf. Um, Nix has the whole DAG, and so it knows when to rebuild these components. And after the rebuild, it'll hash it and cache it somewhere. Um, you can sort of see in this diagram, there's like a content addressed hash. Yeah, all these artifacts are uploaded and can be downloaded. You can hook your laptop to it. You can hook your CI to it. But obviously, that's just optional. It just speed things, it speeds things up. It's not for correctness because you can just do a local rebuild and it should be identical. Another cool thing with Nix is that anything you build inside the environment, so dynamically linked binary, for example, can run on the root host just fine. It's not like a container. We can get like libc mismatches and distro mismatches and all that annoying stuff. You can put it anywhere in your system and it just works. But you can't move it outside your system because it uses a lot of RPath hacks under the hood. But um, for that, we have also in this diagram the app images. App images are our way of distributing static binaries. If you don't know an app image, is just a SquashFS image with a, you know, in the second half, the first half is a static linked kind of shim that knows how to mount the SquashFS image and then transfers the execution inside. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we really like Nix. It works. The bottom line here is that we treat it as a highly reliable distribution mechanism, kind of fully solving the works on my machine problem. And originally, we had a really complex containerized setup where we had all these things we had to wire through, and then it kind of worked and it kind of didn't. Um, there was there's no short of complexity there. Uh, we've had a really good experience with Nix, and uh, I kind of evangelize it a lot. But at the end of the day, it's just it's just a tool, right? And I think it's a pretty nice tool for CI. Uh, that being said, a CI though is as only as good as its tests. At the end of the day, a good CI is invisible. It just runs things and tells you when things break. And so here's kind of how I see the pyramid of quality for BPF trace. Um, the way you should look at this, and <laughs> I could I could have definitely found a better uh, visual, but the pyramid is, I like pyramids. Um, so the wider the part, uh, the more issues I expect to be caught there. Um, note that this does not depict quantity or time. For that, we kind of use our best judgment. So for example, we would prefer unit tests over integration tests and end-to-end -end tests because they run faster, they're more likely to be stable. So the colors here indicate the current status. Green means it's in pretty good shape and that a proper investment, in my opinion, has been made. Yellow means in progress. We want this pretty soon. Um, there's probably a PR open for it, and we think it's likely to drive an outsized improvement. And then red means we haven't started yet. We know we want it eventually because it will be useful. So in the next few slides, I'm, kind of, I'm going to kind of zoom into some of the more interesting techniques that we're using uh, and kind of describe how they work. Oh, but before that, uh, we have some numbers. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't read too much into the numbers because um, numbers by themselves, in this case, uh, they don't necessarily mean anything. I'm just kind of trying to prove that we do have tests. Uh, so the first thing here is runtime tests. Uh, runtime tests are what we call our end-to-end -end tests. And they're end-to-end -end because they actually run the BPF trace binary. And uh, they run some actual scripts and they check the output. So it's you know end-to-end. The diagram below shows how they're supposed to be run. Uh, the outside is the CI, the execution environment. Right now we use GitHub Actions, but really it could be anything. If tomorrow we wanted to go to GitLab or something, I could do that in one day, because Nix just contains all the dependencies. Inside Nix, uh, it, we have all our dependencies, right, including VM test. And VM test is this tool that myself and some others wrote. It's a, basically a QEMU wrapper. It lets you mount the current running user space into a guest VM. Um, while swapping out the kernel. And this lets us test a matrix of kernel versions. Uh, this is a pretty nice property, the mapping part, because that means you can do your builds on the root host because it goes fast there. And then inside the VM, you just run the tests because they go a little slower because of resource constraints. And so this makes your CI faster. Uh, for what it's worth, BPF CI in the kernel also uses VM tests. So uh, hopefully it's more stable than alternatives, and there are a lot of alternatives. I kind of suspect there's more lines of QEMU wrappers, more lines of code in QEMU wrappers than QEMU itself at this point, but hey, you know, everyone has their own thing, it's totally fine. Uh, and then in the very center we have the runtime test, it just kind of runs all the runtime tests. And you can sort of see our mini language up on the top. Uh, Russ Cox had an interesting talk not too long ago about testing techniques in the Golang compiler world. 
And one of the things he mentions is many languages basically have some kind of small format that's easy to read, easy to write, easy to maintain. Um, we have like a pretty small Python script that just parses this, and uh, I think this is a really nice technique. It helps make tests much easier to write and um, good for newcomers. It's not quite done yet. We're pretty close to actually having this done, but I got distracted with some of the other, with the regression and some big string stuff I'm doing, and I'll talk more about that towards the end. Okay, slides are still working. Uh, this is a code gen test. So on the left and the right, the two separate files, they're both checked in. Basically, we want to test our code gen and make sure that the code that we emit is what we expect. And this has two nice properties. The first property is that during review, when someone makes a change in the code gen part, we want to make sure the actual output is what we expect it to be. And so this, you know, instead of running something locally, now the PR comes with this stuff, the CI checks it, and then we're like, okay, this code gen change makes sense. The other benefit is that it catches unintentional changes in CoGen, because CoGen is kind of complex. So if you change a small thing in one place, it might actually kind of propagate all the way to a totally unexpected place, and the CI will double check that you didn't regress anything. Currently, this is a bit noisy, because uh, what we really care about here is a single line. We're testing the left shift, and that's kind of the highlight of it. Uh, everything else is basically noise. Uh, we want to reduce this noise over time because during review, if you change a lot of cogen, it, there's a lot of noise and you kind of, it's kind of hard to pick out what actually is supposed to change. If you've ever done any development in the LLVM world, um, you'll realize, you probably already realize that what I'm describing is called file check. And so maybe we can use that in the future to kind of let you kind of snip out the parts you don't care about, but uh, something to investigate. So this one's really cool. I really like CodeQL. Um, basically what it does is lets you run queries on your code base, like SQL-like queries. And to me, this is the ultimate manifestation of encoding domain knowledge into CI. So uh, for context, what this query does, so in BPF Chase, we have this ongoing project called the Ahead of Time Compilation. Ahead of Time Compilation, uh, basically you compile the script ahead of time, you get the static linked binary. And uh, to do that, you need to serialize some structures to disk. Uh, the serialization library we use, we, you know, you have, to, you have to reference a member variable in this callback and these structs, and this query basically finds all the cases where there's some serialization going on, but you'd fail to reference in this, um, this magic callback. And so this is really nice because, you know, you can encode some very cu uh, custom domain knowledge into CI. Uh, I think Nix will help distribute this really well because it's actually quite complex to run. Uh, locally, you have to like download Java, you have to build a database, you have to do all these things, but Nix, I think, can hide a lot of these details. I'm gonna start speeding up. This is the kind of thing that, uh, so now we're in the section of the talk where I'm talking about what I'm currently working on. So big strings is one of them. Currently, strings in BPF trace are 200 bytes in length and maximum, but default is 64. That's uh, really too small, and a lot of users have some crazy workarounds to get around this, and these are, in my opinion, second problems. So we are trying to fix that. Um, we're actually really close to finishing it, but then I noticed some regressions. Uh, stack allocation, so BPF stacks 512 bytes. You have to be very careful with these allocations. So for the big strings work, it kind of leaks into other language constructs. So we have to make sure that all these big allocations are done off stack. So that's one thing I'm looking at. Uh, dropped events, it's not always possible to run probes in every context because the kernel is a tricky place. And so that's totally okay, but we should definitely tell the user if we dropped any events because if you start not running probes when users expect them to, then uh, it's pretty confusing. I think we have a pretty good handle on this one. Uh, the kernel has done a pretty good job in recent releases of finding all the places where this can happen and exporting these stats to the user space. So all we have to do is wire it through our code base. And this final thing that I'm working on is aligning map null nullness checks. Uh, basically, when you do uh, map lookups in certain map types, uh, the index is statically known. So you know it's inbounds, the verifier knows it's inbounds, but the verifier still makes you a null check. Um, so this, I have a patch that, that teaches the verifier to let you drop these null checks, and this has nice benefits because the verifier can do less work, and also you have a tighter contract with the kernel. So you're like, in case I have a coding bug, the verifier will catch it instead of me catching this at runtime, because you have all these branches that might return early. 
Uh, but yeah, that's all the stuff I had. Any questions? I think we have just a little time. Oh, let's first thank Daniel. <laughs> and then, are there any questions? Thanks. What was the name of the tool that you used to test on uh, VMs? Uh, VMs? Different kernels versions? Yeah, it's a VM test. I have a, yeah, if you just Google VM test and my GitHub handle, D-A-N-O-B-I, it'll, it'll be there. Yeah. Hi, don't you have any issues with the non-determinism while testing? Do you have any examples? Like the print k gave at the very beginning. Don't you test for the fact that print k actually print, want to print any? Oh, it's not a print k. It's oh, sorry, a, print k, the um, print uh, I mean, when you write tests, you try to make them deterministic, right? And so you could get non-determinism, but I don't really think, I don't think we have many of those issues because we tend to make the you know, tests pretty deterministic and we try to catch it during review. That's why I was thinking actually about the, what happens when you run your tests and you run them on your metrics of LTS kernels and some of them have underlying code that is non-deterministic and I thought, probably that's not the case, that that would have an impact on the output of your tests. Sorry, could you repeat the first part? I, I didn't catch that. Okay, so um, when you run your tests, you run them on a actual machine, actually on a virtual machine, but you run it on a different set of kernels, and you interact in some way with those kernels. And my assumption was that the kind of text, the kind of code that you were exercising through the tests, also touched upon parts of the kernel that were non-deterministic. Maybe my assumption is just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, there's definitely things you can attach to in the kernel, like attach points that are kind of non-deterministic and they might change over different kernel versions, but we try to avoid those. We have a lot of experience with that now. If you look in this example specifically, we're using the begin probe. So that's not attached to any event. It just runs as soon as your probes are attached. And that's pretty deterministic and we've designed it in that way. And so if you look at our runtime tests, we mainly rely on begin probes with some smattering of other probes here and there. Got you, thanks. Any more questions? None. Okay. Then let's thank Daniel again. <laughs> <laughs>